Hi, I'm Richard Turner, also called The Shark. This is my friend David Reichel, best known as the creator of Color Switch. 52 Productions would like to invite you to Shark Tales. Richard Turner! Richard Turner. Richard Turner. And looking with both eyes, I couldn't see how he did it. For Richard Turner, he does things that nobody else in the world can do with cars. Nobody. I don't call myself blind because I see things in ways that other people can't see. He's in the Hall of Fame at the Magic Castle. Don't let anyone tell you there's anything you can't do. Could you give us a brief history of this character I've heard of, Di Vernon? Who is this ah, guy? Ah, yes. Well, he was my teacher. He was born in 1894. Wow. June of 1894. I was born in June of 54. We were exactly 60 years apart in age. 1800 is this dinosaur age, right? Di big time dinosaur yeah. age, yes. <laughs> and, uh, uh, but he's known as the King of Cards. He, uh, 19, right around World War I, he went from David Verner, changed his name to Di Vernon, built himself as the King of Cards, and he has not only been around the block, he has been around the century. And the cards. And the cards. Oh, Been around right. the cards. He's been around the cards more than once. Wow. And he's known as the managed fool Houdini. That took place over 100 years ago. But the th cool thing about him is he spent his life seeking out gamblers and hustlers and cheaters and would try to trick them into t tipping their secret gambling information. That's really what was his love. Wait, and he was a trickster? Out. He was a trickster. I feel like hustler. you might have learned some of his tricky ways. Oh, yeah. He learned his tricky ways by looking up, hustling down, hunting down tricksters like Alan Kennedy back in the 1930s. And, and I wanted to meet him. And I, a friend of mine named John Wagner, J.C. Wagner, he went by. Uh, he said, Professor heard about you, some of your deals, and he's willing to meet with you. I was, this was what, um, Friday... July 10th, 1975, and I wanted to meet Vernon. I was working with a guy named Bob Yurkus on, uh, we, we, I helped him work with people on stunts for TV and movies, mm -hmm. and I lived with him at the time. Easy he, stuff. Yeah, mm -hmm. easy stuff, yeah. Falling off cliffs and uh, trying to survive, yeah. It's a Tuesday. It was a Tuesday. No, it was a Friday. It was oh. a Friday, 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 uh, July 10th, and uh, he said, Rich, uh, Rick, he called me Rick, you have a phone call, and I was on the trapeze with a guy named Vic Huntsberger. He was Linda Carter's distant stunt double. Who was Linda Carter? The Wonder Woman, oh. Wonder Woman lady, Wonder Woman lady. And uh, so he, we were swinging on the trapeze together, and it sounded like it was an important call. So I'm on the platform, and I spun around. I hopped on the ladder. We had airbag down below, and Bob Yorkus actually invented the airbag that's used oh, wow. for stunts, yeah? And uh, I did a flip off into the airbag, went over to Bob, and he said, yeah, you have a call here. And it was John Wagner, and he said, Richard, I forgot to tell you, to get into the Magic Castle, you have to have a suit. You have to have a coat and tie. And I thought, what, a coat and tie? I, don't, I didn't have a coat and tie. Who does these days? Oh, well, well, back then, I didn't because I couldn't afford one. I didn't want one. I didn't like them. But I wasn't going to miss the opportunity to meet, to meet Professor Vernon. So I thought, well, how am I going to deal with this? So I asked Vic to take me to the Northridge Shopping Center right near Simi Valley. Mm -hmm. And I went into the shopping center, the uh, men's store, put my cards on a coat rack. And I started thumbing through this coats. And the sales guy comes up to me and says, I'll cut you high card for that coat. I thought, this is my lucky day. I said, okay. I think that's what he was thinking too. Yeah, that's what he thought too. He's that a sucker, a sucker customer? Let's see who was the sucker. I said, okay, and he instantly backed off. He's, I could feel him. He said, no, no, I'm just kidding. I said, tell you what, come over to your desk. I went to the checkout area and there was a glass area and there was a wood area. So you're telling me the shark smelled blood in the water. Uh, blood in the water the and I wanted the, the blood. You got yes. that right. And so, and so I didn't want the glass because I wanted reflections <coughs> off the, you know, if you could see the reflections of the cards. So I took, I thumbed through the deck and I used my excuse that at that time I said my roommate stepped on my glasses and uh, broke them. And so that's why I had to count the cards so close. Mm -hmm. I said at that time I could see the cards out of the corner of my eye. I had no forward vision, but I could get them this way. Oh, he thought this was going to be easy. He, yeah, exactly. This guy can barely see the cards. You <laughs> forgot his glasses. What an idiot. <laughs> idiot. I'll take all his money. <laughs> Big time. So anyway, I took out two twos and a queen. I kind of put a little bend in them so you easily grab them because I was on a wooden surface. I, took, I didn't want the reflection of the glass. So I started throwing them. I said, look. 
I have two twos and a queen. I said, if you follow the queen and find it, I'll pay double for the coat. And he goes, really? So I said, fair. really? He says, but if you miss it, you give me the coat for free. And he agreed to it. Oh, boy. I said, okay, here we go. You see it? See the queen? See the queen? I started throwing him. Where's the queen? He said, here. I said, oh, so sorry. I said, tell you what. I'll give you a chance to get the coat back. Oh, that's I, nice. I'll bet the coat against a pair of pants. Oh. He agreed to it. What a great Fool. deal. Uh, smart guy. And so, guess what? Lost again. So I said, okay, I'll bet you the coat and pants against the shirt and tie. Hmm. And threw it, and guess what? The guy won finally won. No, he lost again. I walked out with a brand new suit, didn't pay a dime. I have a feeling he lost his job. Yeah, I know. I always wonder about that. <laughs> Bill, we keep on missing coats every week. What's going on a here? Coat, pair of pants, shirt, tie. What up? Are you stealing this stuff, Joe? Anyway, so side I, question: Is it pretty easy? It sounds pretty easy to get into this inner circle of all this card shark stuff. Am uh, I? Correct me if I'm wrong. I mean, it doesn't seem like that elite, is it? Work for the card table is the most sophisticated of all forms of sleight of hand. And to get in that inner circle, you have to either be a master or show that you have the ability to become a master. So it's a very, very, very closed society. Does that mean it is hard to get into? That means it's really hard to get into. It's probably oh. the most exclusive, one of the most exclusive clubs. And in Magic, it is the most exclusive uh, club to get in and be a part of because there's so few, because it takes so much work. And how is that different from card magic? Because card shark type slights isn't the same as card magic. You're exactly right. The uh, card mechanic is somebody who can fix a card game. Not mechanical, mechanic. And so that is somebody who fixes a card game. And those techniques for the card table are just many, many times more difficult to develop than the sleight of hand double lifts he glides to perform card magic. And also the difference is if you get caught, you get shot, especially where I'm from, Texas. And I know people that have been shot. I hear they I have guns there. Yes. A Want couple? to see mine? Never mind. Oh boy. <laughs> I almost got bit by the You shark. almost got bit by a, well, my. So that's, that's good to know. Now, yeah. fast forward back to the, to the suit. You're ready to re meet Di Vernon. That must have gone over peachy, keen, perfect, right? <laughs> yeah, right. It was, uh, what was that? That was um, July 11th, and I was with John Wagner. We got to the Magic Castle. I'm in my ratty corduroy coat with my ratty tie and my ratty corduroy pants. Perfect. If I would have known I had a sucker, I would have picked out a better suit. I'll just say that. And I still have that thing as a souvenir in my house because it was the first suit I had to meet Di Vernon. But anyway, so we get to the Magic Castle, when you go up to this alley and you say, Open Sesame, and I always say, Open Sesame Street, and it slides across, and we went up to the library. I think I'm going to start using that one, Open Sesame Street. <laughs> and uh, uh, and then back then, the library was upstairs mm -hmm. you know, uh, in the four-story mansion. Now it's downstairs in the bottom. But went upstairs, and I went into there with, with John Wagner. And of course, I'm only 21 years old, scared little kid, getting ready to meet the master of all masters, and go in there. There was a number of, it was about three or four tables, round tables, and Vernon was sitting at one, and a guy named Tony Giorgio was sitting at the other. I've heard this name. You're going to have to tell us more about ah, that guy. Ah, Tony Giorgio. I hear a, he has connections with mobsters. Yeah, he's a classic. If you ever saw the movie Godfather? Oh, yeah. He played Bruna Tattaglia in the film. There's a scene where a guy takes a knife and stabs it in a guy's hand, pinning the knife to the bar. That was Bruna Tattaglia. Nice guy. Nice guy, yeah. And then they grotted the guy to, uh, to death. Well, that was the guy sitting over there. JC says, Richard, show me your uh, bottom deal. So I started showing him some of my, some of my stuff, and I could tell Vernon was uh, really was not interested. Ooh. He was like, uh, uh, I, I was trying to get his attention, and of course I'm scared, and uh, he has people like this coming up to him all the time, even though he had heard, but he probably forgot that JC said, I wanted you to meet somebody. And of course, JC himself wasn't that big at the time. He mm -hmm. was definitely not in that in a circle. So I'm trying to show him, he goes, uh, what's your name again? Turner, Turner. <clears throat> 
And I says, when you deal like that, I know you're up to something. It's, it's not, not unnatural, unnatural. With a and, voice like that, he could have been a carnival barker, too. Yeah, he could have been a carnival a barker. Good one. Exactly. And so, and then he says, show me a second deal. And I was going like this. And he goes, when you, when you rock your hand like that, I know you're up to something. It's not unnatural. It's unnatural, Turner. Is that what your name, Turner? And so I could tell all he wanted to say is, uh, that, Turner, that's good. Go away. And so. Now that. That, that's got to be a moment where you, you built it all up, you got the shark suit, you go in, and then he starts tearing you apart. Now, how do you deal with that as a 21-year-old baby shark? Yeah, it was hard, and especially because over Kippesine Kip off the side was Tony Georgia going, won't get the money, won't get the money. And uh, like I said, he just played himself in the mo mo movies, a mean, nasty mafia hitman. I hope he didn't have a knife on that. Uh, yeah, me too. And but uh, so the pressure was on me big time. Every time I'd show something, he would go over there and yell. And then finally Vernon said, you know, he grabbed my hand, literally slammed it to the table. He said, now keep dealing. And I kept dealing. He goes, oh, I've, sh I've showed him this particular stud second, except once again, I was doing all these movements and just na unnatural. And he pinned my hand down. And then he said, now deal it. And this is one of my first uh, uh, stud seconds. And he goes, that's a little, that's a little better. That's a little better. And uh, so anyway, I left the castle excited that I met Vernon. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, like you just asked, how did I deal with it? Because, you know, I, I, I played it over and over in my mind. When you deal like that, I know you're up to something. It's right. unnatural. It's suspicious. And so what I did is I got home and I pinned my hand to the table mm -hmm. like this. And I would sit there and I'd analyze every element of what he said, and I would practice it in slow motion. So you would basically embed this to the point to where it was subconscious that's over time. You wouldn't even have to think about that's it. That's exactly right. I would hmm. practice the move over and over till every exacting element of the muscle memory was firmly embedded in my brain. And then how I was able to put in my 10 to 15 to 20 hours a day, because I average, I practice at that time, 14 to 18 hours a day, seven days a week, year after year. So hardly ever. Yeah, yeah exactly. I hardly ever slip. Right. And uh, so the point is that uh, I, bec and I was able to do that because I'd had all these elements put into my brain so I could practice. I'm in the car. First thing I do is get in the car, pull out my little close-up pad, sit down, start practicing. Mm -hmm. I'm in the grocery store. I'm pushing the cart. I'm doing one-hand shuffles. I'm in the uh, shower. I have my Kim cards mm -hmm. practicing. Even I like to get in and out of the shower quick because it was wasted time. Rather have a dirty body. <laughs> Not really. Now, anyway. now, doing all that, did you... Did you eventually go back to the professor, AKA Big Shark, and once he saw your improvements, did he let you start kind of like shadowing him or did he throw well, you away again? Well, actually, it wasn't he asking me to shadow him. It was me shadowing him. Wherever he right. was, I would show up. He's ah. at the castle. I would bribe somebody to drive me to the castle. So you were a stalker. I was a stalker, yes. Perfect. Hello, stalker. I was That's the how you get the job dun, done. Dun, 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 Even dun, today. Dun, 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 dun. Yeah. yeah. They made a movie about you me. You were the inspiration. And they made a movie about you. Steven that Bill, makes Steven, sense now. And I had Steven Spielberg direct it. Wow. Cool. How many people could say that? Anyway, so I, I I've heard of him. Uh, Las Vegas, the Desert Magic Seminar, the mm -hmm. World Magic Seminar now, uh, hosted by Siegfried and Roy at that time. And any magic conventions or fraternal gatherings where magicians would meet together. Every time I would show up, whatever he told me, I had spent my thousand hours of practice right. on that one thing. And he saw this kid is obsessive. No kidding. He's crazier than I am. And so because he he's scared. And, and not only that, but I had improved. Whatever he made the point on, I had improved to the point where he liked it and he was got he got more excited. Anyway, the bottom line is he took me on as his protege, and for 17 years I had the privilege. Oh, so that was the beginning of your 17-year mentorship. That was exactly uh -huh. it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So 17-year mentorship, what are all kind of like the pillars of things that he made sure to teach you and embed in your brain? Well, well, that well, that's a long story, and there's a whole bunch of them. The thing of way the way Vernon tricked me because I back then, just so everybody understands, everyone knows I can't see anything now, but back then I had. 20 over 400. I had no macula, center of vision like this, a hat in front of your face wherever you look. 
out of the peripheral, everything was 20 over 400. 20, 20 is normal. 20 over 200 is considered legally blind. 20 over 400 is twice as low as, as that. So out of the corner of my eye, I could, get, I could see the shadows in glimpses, no detail. Mm -hmm. you know? I could not tell if that was a red or blue deck. So what he would do is he would say, Richard, this is how it's done. And he would describe something. He would say, fingers all on the side of the, on the sides of the deck. These other actions are suspicious. Right. And, and these are moves that he wanted to do, and I believed he could do, and I believed that others could do. But he would tell me to feel his hands, and I would feel them. He would exactly demonstrate how he wanted me to have the hands positioned. And so I thought he could do it. I thought others could do it. And then it was only years later that I found out that each time he was showing me something, he tricked me. He couldn't do it. And Others you told us he was a trickster. Well, he was a trickster, yeah, yeah. and he tricked me. But, it, but the cool thing was, because I believed it could be done, I made it happen. Right. And some of those moves he literally worked on for 50 years. Um, uh, the side, the, um, oh, Dodd's dad, Steven, side, uh, side second, and some mm -hmm. others. Uh, he worked on like for 50 years. Wow. I think I'll tell you about my first day with Ed Marlowe. Well, I just want to backtrack one second. Huh? Uh, so all this practice, all these hours and doing it slow and everything, I've heard you say a term before uh, about about uh, practicing. practicing. What is that term? And, and just mm -hmm. so people know the difference between how a lot yes. of people practice and how you make sure you practice. Okay. Big difference. Yeah, they say practice makes perfect. I disagree mm -hmm. with that. I say perfect practice makes perfect. You can practice something wrong. When you're done, it's perfectly wrong. When I first went up to Vernon and I showed my second deal, I was perfectly wrong. There was not a move that I was doing that was right. It was perfectly wrong. And I see people all the time in the martial arts kicking. They don't fold their kick before they slide that side kick in mm -hmm. and they'll swoop it up. And they practice it over and over and they have it perfectly wrong. Right. Weights, you know, they're, they're sitting there inhaling when they should be exhaling. They have it perfectly wrong. And do you think people do that because they want to try to save themselves time and take shortcuts just to, to get to where they think they can that's do it a, properly that's but they a, can't? That's a very good point. And in many cases, that is the, the case. And part of it is they don't know what is right. And the other half is just what you said. They want to cut corners because this is a little bit easier than the other. So they will spend all their hours doing something the easy way than the way that's going to make it perfectly right. Hmm. So, Fast food practice, instant yeah. gratification. Yeah, and, then, and that's our society in, in spades now. So, now, who was this guy? You just mentioned him a bit ago, Ed Marlowe. Ed Mar Sounds like another godfather type. He's another godfather of magic. Yeah, Ed uh, was born in 1913, mm -hmm. and uh, he has published more, pe more information on card technique probably than anybody in history. The same, same guy, J.C. Wagner, he, his claim to fame is that he introduced me to Marlowe and Vernon. He told Marlowe about me, and I had already had some time with Vernon, and so Ed agreed to agree, uh, meet with me, and mm -hmm. he, was, he lived in Chicago. And at that time, I was still poor as a, poor as a, a church mouse, a church mice with nothing but uh, triscuits, one trisket, maybe Not a half a Not a church shark, a church yeah, mouse. A tri a, yeah, a church, a church shark. And uh, so I wanted to go see him. I took $400 of my gambling mm -hmm. money. That's what it cost for buy a ticket back then. Mm -hmm. And for me at that time, 400 bucks was a lot of money. And right. I always had my gambling money. I never told people about it. And I never dipped into it for any reason. But I thought, this is a good enough reason. So bought my ticket. And I'm now running on card fumes. And so I get to Chicago. This is my first day. Mm -hmm. Okay, I get there. And... I, was, I, I had I got a place at the YMCA because it was the cheapest place in town, and I got in the cab, and I I, I was running late, and I told, oh here's the funny part, I was such an idiot, you know, not an idiot, but yeah. Yeah, well normal typical 20, 22 year old I think it was at the time. Right. I had this big giant trunk about this big, about uh -huh. that wide, about that high, filled it with all my magic stuff, my rings, my guillotine, all this magic crap. You were a magician shark? I had magician stuff, and I even had a stand that yeah. was too big to put in there, so I'm hefty in about this 50-pound yeah. trunk and this stand that it goes on. Uh -huh. As I'm trying to get to through Chicago, getting on the buses. You were a furniture mover? I was a furniture mover. And, and so I get in this cab, and I was running late. I said, can you get me to this address, YMCA, quick? Because Ed was going to meet me there. Mm -hmm. 
And that cabbie was so crazy. He said, okay, he literally hopped up on the curb. And of course they had w those wide, yeah. wide uh, sidewalks. Mm -hmm. And he went ripping down that sidewalk in front of all the traffic, went off the edge, yeah. up the other side, and literally drove up the other side, got me there in a matter of minutes. Whoa. And guess what, I tipped him a full two bucks. Back then, that back was then, a king's ransom. For, for back then, that was a king's ransom for me. Today, you, today that'll get you a slap in the face. <laughs> no, yeah. Two dollars? They, would, they, would, they probably wouldn't even give you a slap over yeah. that. You <laughs> get the heck you out of here. It. But anyway, the Palladium is where, where Ed took me. Oh, he, he, he took you there and introduced you to some interesting characters. Yeah, um, Steve Braun was saying. one, um, David Solomon, wonderful guy, Simon Aronson, may, amazing guy. Howie Schwartzman was the hang that would hang out there. I saw Russell Barnhart, and of course Ed. And we would just sit there and go over moves and techniques. And, uh, and it, I was like a kid in a candy store. We just sat there and talked about shifts, hoffs, moves, bottoms, seconds, middles. That sounds like candy. It was, it was a candy store. I for want a shift, a card, I want a hop. A card chart candy yeah. store, you got that sounds right. Sounds like chocolate. Yeah, and we, we went over all this stuff, and I was, I was just thrilled to death. And every time someone came in, Ed mm -hmm. would say, Richard, do your show for him. And I did, he, I did it so many times that I actually thought he really liked it. And well, actually, I have a quote here that I heard you talk about before that Marla wrote about you, quote, technicians as a rule are not usually good actors or entertainers. Richard Turner is all three. What happened to that letter? That would be a... Pretty cool relic. Yeah, to I hold have on to. I have some nice relics from Ed. He autographed his books to me. Actually, put Richard Marlow Turner. So he gave me his uh, his name and my middle name, and that's those are treasures. But that particular letter, I gave it to Professor Vern. I said, Professor, this is look what I got from Ed, and uh, Ed li uh, Professor liked it so much he showed everybody. He never gave it back to me. He stole it. He stole it. He's a trickster and uh, a thief. A tri well, yeah, he's a trickster and a thief, but I wish I would have got it back. But uh, it didn't change the fact that I never forgot what Ed said. And I had the privilege of uh, going back and forth with Ed for like seven years. I'd fly to Chicago once or twice a year and, mm -hmm. and, and spend time with him. And, and as, as a, the, the years went on, you know, I had more money, so it wasn't quite such a, a big deal as it was in 76, I think, the first year I met up with him. And did he work as a card shark or no. a card magician? No, he worked in a factory of some kind. He worked in a factory? Yeah. And so how did he have the time to do all this card well, stuff? Yeah, I think factory I, work? I thought I, it was like all yeah, the time. I think he was saying, okay, you go pull that lever. And oh, he was like a manager. I don't know what he was, oh. but he obviously he just had misdirect he everybody. Just, yeah, he obviously had time to spend uh, working with the cards. The factory falls apart like, who's running this? Ed! I don't know. I did yeah. all the things I was supposed to do. Yeah, but the cards are the cards are working really well. When in reality, Factory's he not, was working yeah. on the cards. Yeah, exactly. Fixing so, the cards, not fixing the factory. Fixing the cards. But hey, I was very honored to have spent, like I said, seven years with Ed, going back and forth, and mm -hmm. and uh, and real, real quick story. Uh, I would one day, one week, I'd be with Ed. The next week, I'd be with Professor, and Professor mm -hmm. kept saying, Richard. Invite Ed out here. They'll love him out here because he never left Chicago. He never left the area. And he would tell me, C invite him out. And so I, uh, would, I would go and see Ed. I said, Ed, come to the castle. They'd love you out here. And he did not want to go out there. And finally. Why not? Well, I, I, I don't, there, there was a kind of a rivalry between Ed and Professor Vernon. Ah, jealous mentors. Well, it, the same it, old story. Yeah, same old story. But it started because. Uh, Vernon came in from New York and spent some time in Chicago, and all the Chicago boys wanted to see Professor because mm -hmm. Ed's there all the time. Yeah, and he felt a little bit put back right. that the, all the attention was going on him. So he he uh, could have called Tony Giorgio; he could have taken care of it with he a knife. Would take it with a knife. Yeah, a little bar pinning does it mm -hmm. every time. But eventually, the bottom line is Ed did come out, and he was greatly received. Oh. Oh, mm -hmm. he did come out. Yeah, awesome. he finally did come out. Now, how about this Charlie Miller guy? That sounds like a cool name. Was it a cool guy? Charlie Miller was a kind of a contemporary with Professor Vernon. He was a number of years younger, but he was the other legend. Marlo Miller and uh, Vernon were the three big, big boys. There was another guy named Larry Jennings. Whenever I was with the professor at the castle, Larry was there. And Larry was kind of another nemesis, just like Georgie was. They were the two people that just thumbs down on right. me. Half, most of the time I was there for the first number of years. And Larry would always say, 
uh, you know, you know when I would show him something or some some new hop that I developed mm -hmm. or, or second or whatever. And as soon as the professor would leave, he'd say, he would say, "Well, Charlie does it better. Charlie does it better. Charlie wow. does it better." And so I always always wanted to meet this elusive Charlie Miller. Right. So I'm at my home. I'm banging on my heavy bag. You know, practice mm -hmm. my kicks. Yeah. Bam, bam! I get this call. Hello, this is Charlie Miller. Charlie Miller. Charlie Miller. Because okay, that, that was kind of his trademark. He'd go, "Hello, this is Charlie. This is Charlie. Yeah. Charlie, but you want to come over for a session?" And I thought, "Yes, indeed." I was jumping for joy because I've been wanting to meet this guy forever. High noon showdown. High noon showdown. So I, I was dating a girl at that time named Jackie Gleason. Mm -hmm. Not like the honeymooners. Oh that yeah, Jackie. honeymooners. Yeah, that, 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 that was not that. Uh -huh. I like that. Much, show, much, much prettier. Oh yeah, he was funny. But this is a pretty blonde. Mm -hmm. And uh, I said, Jackie, will you give me a ride to LA? And she goes, okay. And uh, Johnny, um, Charlie gave me his address. He was staying at Johnny Thompson's home in, in uh, Beverly Hills, mm -hmm. no, in Hollywood and Hollywood. Jackie says, what do I do when I get there? I said, you don't have to do anything. Just smile and act pretty. Just smile and be pretty. And so we get there, and Johnny had this giant table. I mean, it was like, I think it was 1750s. Uh, table, big giant mm -hmm. table like you see in that King's Castle Game or something. Game of Thrones. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, I sat at this end, Charlie sat at the other end quite a ways away, and mm -hmm. Jackie sat to my left. And the odd thing is, Charlie had this servant, this Asian lady that had a pigtail. And that pigtail, all the way, all the way down to the floor and maybe another six inches longer than her body. As we're eating, the odd thing was, she kept trying to put the food in my mouth. And that was a little bit too Did much. Did you think you were a baby? I, I, was, I was wondering that, and I was wondering if maybe someone told her I had problems seeing, so if I can't, I can't find my own mouth ah. or something. So that was, that was why I was a little bit set off on that. Mm -hmm. And I said, I can feed myself. I know where my mouth is. And, and then finally, Charlie goes... Uh, <laughs> Or you could have been like, excuse me, I brought my own feeder to your, <laughs> I have, your blonde I, I have friend. a pair. Well, that's right. Yeah. I have my own feeder. Yeah, yeah hello. Jackie. So I have four hands. I don't need your other fifth yeah. and sixth. Anyway, so Charlie's sitting across the table. He goes, I hear you're a magician. And I says, well, I'm not really a magician. I call myself a card mechanic. I said, I told him, I said, I really don't like the word magic, magician, because it sounds too much like musician. And the odd thing was, Charlie says, I don't like the word magician either because sometimes I'll say I'm a magician and people think I said I'm a musician. So Charlie oh, didn't like connection. it any more than I did. And I thought, well, that was interesting. Relating. Yeah, and then he go, we started talking about dealing and mechanics and he said, the difference between a card mechanic and a magician is like the difference between a fencer, two foils facing each other down. So Charlie and I, we go to this room. He had a table and I came out with two decks and mm -hmm. Charlie came out with a dozen other decks. Right and all different sizes and shapes. Mm -hmm. And we were just going over techniques, bottoms, theory, palming, switches, shuffles, false shuffles, false steals. We just went over everything for right. hours all the way into the next morning. Hmm. And then he would say, you mind if I watch it from here? He wanted to watch from every ugly advantage point, right. advantage point he could. So he's standing behind me said, I said, I want to see some bottoms. I said, which one of your decks do you want me to use? And he had this one deck that was about a quarter inch bigger, either way, I think maybe oh, it was wow. Jack Daniels deck. Is the Jack Daniels deck that's bigger than uh, the poker size? I wouldn't know. Anyway, that. I don't remember what it was, but it was about a quarter inch bigger, which right. is harder to deal with. It was with. bigger. And that's the one he told me to use. I said, thank you very much, Charlie. So I pick up that deck and I'm sitting there dealing my, the bottoms and the seconds. And he goes, you might not watch it over here. He literally just went around and around. And he goes, hmm. this was the highlight of my night. Yeah. He says, kid, they call me Eagle Eye Charlie. Charlie sees everything, kid. He says, I can't see it, kid. I can't see it. And those words will remain in my head for the rest of my life. It hmm. was a, one of the top highlights of my life. Wow. Having the infamous, the famous Eagle Charlie Miller Eye give me that kind of Charlie. Uh, praise. Yeah. Now, speaking of all your moves, the Turner second or the Shark second is pretty well known. And what specifically about it makes it superior to the other seconds. And what is a push-off second in the first place? Well, a push-off, you know, there's a strike second where you'll, you'll deal the card from the top. Push-off, you're dealing off two cards. And I think it's better because the, there's no leaking between the cards. Mm -hmm. And people are always asking me, where did you first hear about a push-off? Right. And it first started when I was, oh gosh, in uh, I think 11 or 12 years oh, old. Oh, wow. Yeah, a, a, an old lady. 
she put some pieces of a book called Expert at the Card Table uh, on this old ta a tape recorder, and I've mm -hmm. listened to it. So that's where I got the first idea of a She push didn't shot. put it on an iPod? A, a, a low pod. Low pod, okay. Your iPod, ear pod, nose pod. Got it, check. A pod, no way. Yeah. Just making sure. Yeah, yeah, or just pod. In the 60s, I would hear a guy named John Scarney, mm -hmm. who was the kind of the king of gambling stuff. Right. And I actually saw eight, uh, 16 millimeters of him showing seconds and bottoms for the military from World War II. Mm -hmm. And he would be on these talk shows, and he would talk about how dealing the push-off, how many hours it took him to be able to feel exactly two cards. And so that's where I first got my concepts from. It was from Erdnays, but more, more from uh, John Scarney. You did that session with Charlie Miller. Did you ever do sessions with Tony Giorgio? And if so, how did those go or anyone uh, else? Yeah, Tony Giorgio was a... Nemesis. He, yeah, and for years. We battled each other for 21 years. Wow. And he, like, I think it was by maybe 78 or 79. I'm in the... Vernon had his own SETI with a uh, little round table and another SETI, you know, the love, love chair, two-person chairs. Mm -hmm. And they would face each other, and that's where Vernon would sit in the far left uh, corner, and then right to the other side was where the people would sit and watch and show him stuff. I came in to hope that Vernon was up playing, he would play hearts with Kuda Bucks. Kuda Bucks was an Indian who was, he was, he was on Ripley's, Kuda believe Bucks. it or not, in the 1930s, with actually the Rick, when Ripley was still alive. Right. First person to walk on uh, hot coals and be buried alive. You know, he had, at the time, he had the record for being a buried alive, if I remember Ripley right. Ripley did? No, oh, Kuda Bucks. Kuda Bucks. Kuda Bucks. He was Kuda on Bucks. Ripley's show. Ripley's Believe It or Not show. And so, <clears throat> and he had one eyebrow sweat all the way across his head and air, ears, hair pouring out his ears. But his act was, he had blindfolded himself and people would write numbers on a board and he would, you know, four, three different things, then he would underline it and solve it as, you know, as if he was doing it without seeing. But he had his little ways of uh, yeah. doing that particular act. But um, he would go up and play hearts with Professor in the library. And I was waiting for him to come down. Mm -hmm. Who comes in but Mr. Tony Giorgio. And I Tony Giorgio. always wanted to see him. And I, at the same time, it was, it was like being with my karate instructor. Right. You know, you know uh, uh, I, I was going to get smacked, but it was going to be for my benefit. And I figured... It's worth the smack if I learn a new slight. And I'm just waiting for Georgie to show this or that. And, and he's showing the second and bottom. And he goes, I've won houses with my money. Mm -hmm. What you would do would never get the money. So he was a humble guy. He yeah, was very humble. And I finally worked up enough guts to say, yeah, but I've been getting the money since I was a kid. He goes, yeah, penny ante games, no doubt. But what you do in big games would never fly. Wow. And so... Um, I just uh, listened to him and listened to him, and then uh, when he would leave, the bartenders would uh, tell me, don't listen to him, he's just a big arrogant, and uh, he's just jealous of you, and because they would see him yelling and screaming. There was one oh, So time, he would be yelling this so that the bartenders... Oh, oh everybody heard. He, everybody they all heard. The, so bad that they had to come console you. <laughs> yeah, they, wow. Well, after he left. Yeah. But I mean, there was one time, were too scared I remember otherwise. standing there. And, and I would just so badly want to put one of my jump turn kicks right in his yeah. gut. It's a jump turn kick with four boards. <laughs> and I've taken people down with that kick. And then I'm glad I didn't uh, act on that impulse because turns out Giorgio was a professional b a boxer at one time and he was like 50 pounds heavier than I was. Hmm. He would have been, I would have gotten myself in some trouble. But uh, that was my uh, time with Tony Giorgio, one of the times. We battled each other right. for 30, well, for 21 years mm -hmm. until finally, well, I'll save this story for another day, uh, how things turned around because it, he ended, ended up becoming a very good friend of mine. Mm. Well, with all these stories that we've kind of gone over through your career, sounds like he had a lot of successes. There's got to be at least one Guppy size failure? Oh. Give us something. Well, it's got to be something. Failures. You can't. You can't be no. the 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 god shark that just gobbles everything up and doesn't ever have anything bad happen. No. The only people that have no failures are those that don't, those that don't do anything. Those that don't try. If you don't try, 
<laughs> if you try, you win, you did it. If you try, you fail, you get up and do it again. But I had lots of failures. I mean, some of the more embarrassing ones. I wanted, I wanted to be a member of the, I wanted to perform at the castle. Mm -hmm. I, I became a member with no effort at all in 1975 mm -hmm. or 76 or something. But in 76, I wanted to be a performing member. Member, that's a whole different category. I did my audition, failed. Seventy-seven, did my audition, failed. Did my audition, seventy-eight, failed again. Finally, the judge says, "Richard, you're kind of a magician's magician, but with that ratty old corduroy coat and those ratty pants and those shoes with holes in them, you look like Robinson Crusoe. You're not castle material." And uh, uh, so I, uh, that was the same coat I won like three or four years earlier mm -hmm. to meet by Di Vernon. But it's the only thing I had. And, and of course, I thought my technique alone would fly. And then, so then, that same, uh, in 78, I entered a magic competition. I got second place. I was beat out by Ray Grismer, who was Di Vernon's music teacher. Di, Ray would teach Professor uh, the piano and piano professor would teach Ray card stuff, mm. card magic. And uh, he got first place, I got second place. And mm. again, another loser. Then I decided to fo follow my friend Armando, who we first met in 1973, on the gong show. Mm -hmm. And he actually won four times on the gong show. And he got on there and he did the beautiful eggs from mouth, or uh, balls from mouth, first place, 30 points. I thought, I'm going to go on the gong show and win that $516.32. At that time, would have been a mass fortune. You for could me. buy a grande ca cappuccino at Starbucks. Would be the, with that 500 money. bucks, you get a cappuccino yeah. with, a bit, with a cinnamon roll. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, I go on the show and I got second place again. Uh, That's the first loser. Yeah, uh, I got another second place. I walked out with a brand new set of forks, knives, and spoons. And I realized I am still a second-rate performer. And so I thought about what was, what was told to me, that with that suit, you look like Robinson Crusoe. And so that was when I changed my look and I uh, realized, okay, you know, your technique, that's one thing. You have to have presentation to go with it. Did you now, go back to your three Monty friend and get another free suit? No, I did not, but I did. <laughs> that would have been a good idea. Yeah, that would have been, been, been cheaper. Now would have been really to, dumb. Yeah, that would have been, if he I, saw you coming I don't back, think he would have I'll get him this time. Again. Anyway, so I, but I, that's when I first got my, fir my first um, riverboat gambler outfit. Mm -hmm. And I've dressed like a slick riverboat gambler. I realized that uh, you know, I needed to change my dress and all. Mm -hmm. And uh, the thing here is what I say. There's lots of lessons learned from losses. Lots of lessons learned from losses. You can take those lessons and let them take you down, or you can take those lessons and learn from them and have them move you forward. So lots of lessons learned from losses. Well, on that note, I think that's a great way to end this episode. I'm out mm -hmm. of questions. I, think I know you're not out of seconds. Oh, uh, I'm not out of seconds, but we will second out. Sounds good. Over and out. Over and out. Over and out. Shark Copy off. that. Roger that. Roger that. See you next time. And I bet there are not three people in the whole room here who can palm a card like a real expert. Now this man here, Richard Turner, he does things that nobody else in the world can do with cards. Nobody. I don't care if you go to China or France or Germany. He does things that nobody else can do. He does them beautifully. But as I say, that's very rare. Very rare to have an expert like that.